Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. This is our next uh, installment of the SK Dharma Lingam series on um, various aspects pertaining to cancer. And uh, this March, in line with it being uh, Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, we're very fortunate and, of course, privileged to have with us Professor Dr. April Camilla Roslani. Uh, Prof. April, um, as I will very uh, quickly um, kind of abbreviate her name too, uh, needs no introduction to any of us. But anyway, in case someone's joining us from really overseas, I'll, kind of, I'll just kind of put in uh, a, a little brief introduction about Prof. Prof is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Malaya. She is also a colorectal surgeon and uh, has done an extensive amount of work in the field as well as in the field of surgery. She's been instrumental in doing a lot of mentoring for surgery. A lot of surgeons in the kind of local landscape have been trained and mentored by her. And she's been very active in research and development in, in the field of surgery as well. And um, I know from, um, from kind of a lot of um, uh, looking at the work that Prof's done over the years, that she has also been very instrumental in bringing a lot of women into the surgical uh, sphere as well. And, and a lot of that has been through her uh, kind of inspirational work along with, of course, others like Prof Yip and all that. But uh, she really serves as kind of a, a beacon of, of the wonderful work that, that, uh, that uh, the, the field of surgery has done in, in Malaysia today. So Prof, thank you very much for joining us. Such a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, thank you for taking a bit of time off your really, really, really busy schedule. It's really a pleasure and a privilege um, to be invited, Dr. Murali. I can't thank you enough. And it's, it's really always, um, you know, it, it's not a hardship actually to spend time with members of the fraternity, you know, just to uh, hopefully uh, bring us all to a better understanding of how to um, manage our patients better. So it's, it's a pleasure for me. Right, lovely. Thank you so much, Prof. So, ladies and gentlemen, as as we as I was mentioning earlier, it's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and um, if you'd forgive my French, we seem to be doing a shitty job at it. So, um, colorectal cancer remember remains one of the kind of very highly uh, uh, kind of cancers that we need to be aware about, a little bit more careful about, and our sad fact is that we seem to be still picking up a lot of the cancers late and I think a lot more work can be done and will be done by all of us and uh, Prof is here to kind of give us tips insights into the field and uh, give us a lot more kind of energize the work that we do so that we can do it much better then um, in the interest of time I'm going to just kind of turn over the screen to Prof just before I do that I want to kindly remind everyone if we can keep our videos off you can keep our audios off and then feel free and there's, there's no um, issue with chats so you can just drop questions onto the chat box and then I'll field them as we go into the first uh, kind of end of the first segment and then we have another opportunity for questions at the end of the second segment uh, and don't forget you need to pay attention to get your code words for your CME attendance so without further ado please allow me to turn the, the screen share over to prof and then from prof to take it from there prof it's all yours Okay, thanks very much. Are you able to hear, uh, to see my screen? Yes, Prof, very clearly. Okay, all right. And, and the sound is all right, yeah? Yes, it is. All right. Um, so once again, thank you so much uh, for the honor of uh, being part of this prestigious uh, lecture series. Uh, I understand that uh, Dato S.K. Dharmalingam was the founder of uh, National Cancer Society in Malaysia. Um, and so I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to deliver this uh, talk. Um, I was actually asked to address the management of colorectal cancer in primary care, uh, specifically in Malaysia. And uh, the specific briefs were to provide an overview of colorectal cancer in Malaysia, um, mention some of the challenges and pitfalls of managing um, colorectal cancer optimally, 
and then give you a brief uh, overview of what is the current, um, you know, landscape in terms of screening, diagnosis, and treatment of colorectal cancer, as well as my perspective on what the role of primary care physicians uh, could be or should be um, in colorectal cancer care. So um, as you can see, that's quite a lot of um, material to get through uh, in a single morning. Um, so uh, forgive me if I um, go through it uh, fairly briefly in each of these areas, but I hope that will free up uh, some time in the question and answer sessions for you to address um, any uh, queries you might have. So we'll start off with the overview. And I think this is um, no surprise to any of you uh, in that uh, when you look at global cancer incidents, colorectal cancer um, consistently falls in the top three cancers uh, overall. And so that's together with uh, lung cancer as well as breast cancer. But what is sad is that um, if you look at breast cancer, you will find that uh, advances in treatment uh, have meant uh, that the mortality as a result of breast cancer is, has, has dropped significantly, while for lung and colorectal cancer, it remains uh, in the top. When you look specifically at colorectal cancer and uh, the global spread, um, the upper map shows you the incidence uh, worldwide and the lower map shows you the mortality. And again, you will see that while colorectal cancer seems to have a predilection or a higher uh, incidence in developed countries, hence, if you see the colors, the darker colors are concentrated in North America, in Europe, uh, and also in Australasia, um, you will see that Malaysia's color is not that light. It's, it's certainly creeping up and that's sort of in keeping with um, our progress to becoming um, a more developed nation, okay? Uh, also, if you look at mortality, unfortunately, the mortality uh, in the countries of higher uh, prevalence, um, you know, it's starting to come down if you look at North America, uh, but uh, in less developed countries, um, particularly if you look at the Southeast Asian region, you'll find that mortality is not as low as you might think. And so you have this disconnect, you know, that uh, in areas where it's prevalent, um, perhaps because of the focus, because of the direction and awareness uh, uh, within healthcare systems, um, you are starting to see a drop in the mortality, if not the incidence. Whereas in countries uh, with lower resources, um, although the incidence might be lower, the mortality, the impact of the disease is uh, higher. The other global trend that we're starting to see is that there is a rising um, incidence in younger patients. And, and by young patients, I mean those below the age of 50. Now we're talking about sporadic cancers, yeah? So the, my entire talk will really be focused on sporadic cancers rather than familial cancers, uh, because familial cancers really form a very small proportion of the overall. So, so back to these young sporadic cancers. On the left, you will see that um, if you look at whether it's localized disease, regional disease, or distant disease, at the top of the graphs, you will see the um, trend for um, older patients and at the bottom of the graph you will see the trend for younger patients and what you will see is that across um, all uh, stages of disease you will see that the young patient trend is on the uptick okay whereas in the older patients you will see that the uh, line is uh, falling down and on the right um, you will see that illustrated even more clearly across time you will see that the median age of diagnosis, and this is American data, has dropped significantly. Also, we know that these young sporadic cancers have a slightly different biology. There's a greater preponderance of poorly differentiated cancers, and they tend to be uh, more likely to be mucinous, and these are poor prognostic indicators. What about in Malaysia? Um, actually, the trends have been fairly consistent over the last um, two uh, National Cancer Registry reports. So what you will see is that um, for, for men, uh, colorectal cancer is now the number one cancer. Uh, in women, it's still number two. But what you will see is that with older patients, um, the breast cancer incidence starts to drop 
whereas the colorectal cancer incidence keeps on rising. Also, if you look at the distribution across age groups, I think what is also a consistent trend is that while only a minority of patients are below the age of 50, it is a significant and consistent minority uh, in the region of about 15%. And they are completely missed at the moment by um, screening strategies. We also um, know this, that there is ethnic variation in terms of the incidence in Malaysia. It tends to be more, more prevalent in the Chinese population. Um, and then followed by the Malays and the Indians. So what about young patients in Malaysia? There's actually a limited evidence uh, for us to look at this, uh, but we have had a paper accepted in the Singapore Medical Journal where we looked at um, institutional data. So we compared below and over 50s. Um, and what we found was that actually there's no difference in gender distribution or stage of presentation, which was interesting because we anticipated that uh, they would present at later stages. Um, however, we found, and this is consistent with the breast cancer um, literature, uh, that those below the age of 50 were more likely to be Malays, and they did have poorer biology, as mentioned before. And this is just to show you the, the, the trend. Uh, what you will see is that in our institution, the um, uh, age of uh, patients has steadily come down. So the older patients have reduced in proportion to the younger patients. But what we found uh, was that in terms of survival, once you match them for stage, there did not seem to be um, a difference in the long-term survival between the older and younger groups. Okay, what about the ethnic variation? And this is again something that's, that's interesting. Um, if you look at the population of um, East Malaysia and the land mass of East Malaysia, it actually accounts for a large uh, proportion. Um, but if you compare the ethnic distribution um, nationally, you will see that the indigenous populations really form a very small percentage. But if you look at the distribution in Sabah and Sarawak, you'll see that the proportions are much, much greater. And yet we haven't really specifically addressed the variation in um, indigenous populations. Uh, in fact, you have to go back as far as the 1998 uh, clinical practice guidelines to see any mention of the indigenous populations separate from the Malay populations. So um, we looked at this um, recently um, with one of my master's students, um, Anu Valen, um, and we looked at Sabah in particular because they have a large proportion of indigenous populations. Um, so in terms of comparing to the Chinese population in Sabah, we found that they were more likely to be younger. And also we found that this risk the relative risk of being a young colorectal cancer patient was three times higher in the indigenous population compared to the Chinese. Also, although there was no difference in terms of the, the site, um, there was a distinct difference um, in terms of the histology in that the indigenous populations were more likely to be um, mucinous adenocarcinomas. We also found that they were more likely to refuse treatment, they were more likely to need palliative care or need palliative surgery, and they were less likely to be offered um, less invasive uh, palliative treatments like stenting. So we move on to diagnosis and treatment. You know, as, as surgeons, we like to think we have control of um, disease, um, but the reality is that biology is still king. And this goes back to what a very famous oncologist, Katie, said in 1997. But we do what we can. And I think what's important to um, acknowledge is that the approach to managing cancer and indeed um, medical conditions in general has evolved. We now talk about precision medicine and that's addressing the treatment of the individual. But as a healthcare system, we talk about value-based medicine, which is combining not just the evidence base, but looking at the healthcare economics and also the cultural values of the population. 
Also, there's been um, evolution in the understanding of colorectal carcinogenesis. And I've just put up this slide, not, not really for you to memorize, uh, but just for you to see that um, we have a greater understanding of the uh, mutations and drivers behind uh, sporadic colorectal cancers. You know, so this is a, a, a shift in attitudes where we used to think that these were mainly important uh, in familiar cancers, but now we understand that it has implications also uh, for sporadic cancers. And so this is just a schematic of how these might interact. And so you will see that um, you could have a sporadic mutation up here on the right, and these could be at various uh, sites. Um, and then what happens is that you will get uh, different downstream effects, which ultimately result in cancer. And again, this is not really for you to memorize, but this is just illustrating some of the pathways that are now targets for uh, system systemic therapy. Um, this you will probably have heard of, which is TGF beta, all right, and also uh, EGFR, which is the epidermal growth factor receptor. So these are targets uh, for um, uh, systematic uh, systemic therapy. Uh, we also have the RAS genes here, which are uh, important for downstream uh, effects. So if you can block uh, these um, target sites, uh, you may be able to uh, mitigate the progress uh, of cancer, particularly in advanced cancers. This is just to show um, uh, why uh, the, uh, perhaps we have a gender difference uh, between male and female uh, preponderance, um, and it's to do with the uh, estrogen receptors, uh, which actually, uh, again, mitigate the downstream effects um, of uh, mutations. Another interesting concept is that of circulating tumor cells, and this illustrates why or how a tumor, a primary tumor, can actually uh, implant uh, in a distant site. Uh, and what happens is that when it gets into the bloodstream, um, they form these uh, CTC clusters, which has a protective effect and therefore um, sort of uh, is a defense against the body's uh, immune system, which is why they're able to survive uh, until they reach the secondary site. One final thing I just want to mention that um, has really informed our understanding of uh, colorectal cancer uh, carcinogenesis is the gut microbiota. And this is basically the, the entire um, uh, population of uh, bacteria that um, exists with us as, as commensals in our gut. And uh, what this um, diagram shows is that your gut composition is not static. Uh, it evolves, it changes. And some of the things that can um, influence this um, are age, um, your diet, uh, whether or not you use antibiotics, um, probiotics, uh, as well as uh, we believe that um, geography also plays a role. So what's the big deal then if, if your uh, gut microbiome changes? Well, um, we know that uh, to a large extent, the, the, the majority of the bacteria in our gut are, are commensals. They um, don't cause us harm. But importantly, they also keep the more pathogenic species under control. So what happens then if that uh, uh, symbiosis or that the proportions change is that the more pathogenic bacteria can then cause uh, dysbiosis with barrier failure, chronic inflammation, and that then just allows a whole um, uh, number of downstream effects that ultimately lead to neoplastic changes. And so this was some work that we did uh, together with uh, Johns Hopkins um, University. And what we demonstrated was that if you look at right colon cancers and left colon cancers, they seem to be quite distinct um, in that the right colon cancers seem to be more associated with biofilms and also with specific types of uh, bacteria. And here, if you look at the diagram on the right, you will see that the red dots um, represent those cancers that are associated with biofilms and the ones with the blue dots uh, are not. So why is this important? Well, 
biofilms, as you know, are sort of a complex um, uh, structure comprising of both the, the bacteria, the host tissues, um, as well as um, uh, sometimes uh, foreign material. Okay, so this suggests that um, the right-sided cancers are associated with a change um, in the pathogenic uh, components uh, of the microbiome and that they do have uh, some influence in carcinogenesis. Are there any updates in terms of how we diagnose? Well, um, you know, there really is no substitute for histological diagnosis. Uh, but what has changed now is that we are more and more likely to uh, request molecular testing as well. In particular, KRAS and BRAF testing is, is almost um, uh, routine now, at least in my institution. The biopsies we obtain through colonoscopy. Occasionally, we'll need to also do image-guided biopsy of metastases. Um, and sometimes if they present in an emergent setting, you know, the, the histology results from the resected um, specimen. Um, I'm, I'm just briefly mentioning familial because, um, of course, the molecular testing for uh, familial cases is, is much more important. Um, and usually we would test the index case in order to identify the uh, markers, uh, after which we would offer um, genetic testing for the uh, asymptomatic relatives. Again, what has become uh, increasingly uh, important is um, staging. And this is now multimodality, so we don't just rely on one technique oftentimes. Um, so you will see here an array of uh, imaging modalities. Um, endorectal ultrasound I, I find useful for rectal cancers, particularly early stage cancers. Uh, CT is our go-to imaging just for general um, staging modality. Uh, MRI, again, is important for rectal cancers in particular, and we use it sometimes for liver metastases to assess that. Um, and PET-CT is really uh, more important for uh, assessing advanced disease um, or for uh, assessing um, response to treatment. Again, something which is now de rigueur is that treatment is multidisciplinary. So we tend to discuss um, almost all our cases in uh, multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, that includes our gastroenterologists, our radiologists, oncologists, and also uh, palliative care uh, physicians. Uh, very often I have to involve my um, other surgical colleagues, you know, whether it's the urologist or uh, the neurosurgeon even, um, or more frequently it would be the hepatobiliary surgeon because um, we have gone into resecting liver metastases as well. So what has changed in surgery? Um, well, I suppose I wouldn't say it's changed because um, minimal access surgery has been around since the 1990s. Um, but we're certainly doing um, not just minimal access surgery where we try to minimize the injury, but we're also doing more extended resections. And we're now um, involving the use of adjuncts as well in, in our surgical treatments. So I'm just going to address this very, very briefly because I know I'm not addressing a surgical audience, but I think it's quite uh, important um, for you to have an idea of what's feasible um, from a surgical perspective. So why are we uh, favoring a minimal access approach where possible? Uh, well, because it's associated with less post-operative pain and functionally patients uh, return to normal much more quickly. Uh, there are fewer uh, infections associated with it. They, they end up in hospital for a much shorter stay. And uh, certainly in developed countries, there appears to be no difference in overall costs. Although I would say that's not entirely true in Malaysia. There is a slightly increased um, cost um, when performing laparoscopic operations um, in our patients. Um, I would say at the present moment, evidence, because I do remember in, in my early career uh, being told, number one, don't offer any surgery to older patients. And number two, uh, beyond the very early stage um, tumors, you know, we shouldn't be doing any surgery and we should just uh, send the patients on to the oncologist. So what do I mean by extended resections? We talk these days about extended lymphadenectomy. Uh, we talk about extended margins um, as well as multivisceral resections. And these might be 
resections of other organs which are on block with the primary tumor, or it could be resection of metastases in distant organs. And by this, I, I include hepatectomies, uh, lobectomies, um, as well as peritoneectomies. But I'm just going to focus uh, on a few of these areas because um, the extended margins and lymphadenectomies, that's fairly um, standard management now. And also, um, you know, simple multivisceral resections like you know, taking uh, uh, an ovary or taking um, the uh, salpings is really not um, uh, difficult to do. So I'm just going to focus on the more difficult um, extended resections. The first one is secretomy, and so these are for rectal cancers uh, that are locally advanced, and in spite of neoadjuvant therapies, um, you know, uh, the involvement of the sacrum is still present. Um, so this is, as you might imagine, quite um, a, a radical operation. It's not for everyone again. Um, but what's important to note is that if you can get an R0 resection, then you actually have a very good long-term survival. But of course, they have to survive the operation first. So that's why I say it's not for everyone. Um, and this is what it looks like uh, on the left here. You will see we flipped the patient um, over uh, into the prone position and we have exposed the sacrum and are now uh, starting to uh, resect it. You can see it's not for the faint hearted. It might look a little bit brutal, uh, but this was a young patient um, who had a good um, uh, fitness for surgery. And you can see this was the scar that he was left with um, from, from behind. Okay. What about cytoreductive surgery? And this refers to um, patients with peritoneal metastases. Okay. So what we normally do is that we calculate the PCI, that's the uh, uh, peritoneal uh, index. Uh, which tells you how extensive the peritoneal involvement is. Um, and then what we would then perform is a peritoneectomy. And again, if you can get uh, uh, an R0 resection with this, you can see on the right that you have, um, you know, very good or at least better than uh, expected um, long-term survival. Okay, so in our own uh, center, if you look at all patients who've had um, extended resection, you want to know that they actually have good um, uh, long-term survival. And so uh, what you will see here is that um, we have uh, roughly a 45% five-year survival for extended resections. And that's in comparison with uh, 10 or less um, if uh, they do not have the extended resection. And that's what we're showing um, here, 45% uh, of extended resections. Now, these standard resections are patients who are not needing extended resection. So even then, you see it's only 52%. So, you know, for selected patients, this is a good option. What about adjuncts? Um, let's say, you know, the peritoneal involvement is too great and it, it's uh, not appropriate for uh, cytoreductive surgery. We now offer PIPEC, um, which is a pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy. And so this uses a special system that actually injects uh, chemotherapy intra-abdominally. Uh, um, and because of the aerosolization and the pressure, it actually penetrates into the tissues very well. Uh, and we have had patients that have had a very good response to this. So it, it's different from um, uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which I believe um, some uh, oncologists and some surgeons perform. It's different from what you may see your um, gynae colleagues doing. This is actually a surgical procedure um, with um, promising outcomes. So if I could just summarize this for you, um, you will see that uh, in terms of treatment of colorectal cancer, it is multimodality. Uh, we do have local therapies, uh, we have surgery and we have systemic therapy. And what you can see is that what you would choose um, would depend on the stage um, of the patient at presentation. And so for early stage cancers, which is really what we want to be targeting, the mainstay of treatment is still surgery. And to some uh, 
uh, extent, endoscopic therapies might be helpful as well. In this, we're talking about really early cancers, so malignant polyps or, or really small uh, cancers, um, you know, your uh, T0s or um, TISs. So those might be able to be treated with endoscopic therapy. On the right, you will see a plethora of um, systemic therapies that can be used. Um, chemotherapy is standard. Targeted therapies, um, these are usually uh, antibody therapies that are targeted at those sites that I showed you earlier on. Immunotherapy is something that's uh, coming more and more into um, mainstream uh, management. And, uh, you know, I, I often get people confused about what is targeted therapy versus immunotherapy because they do tend to be um, based on antibodies. Uh, but immunotherapy, rather than targeting um, uh, cancer sites themselves, uh, is actually a form of therapy that either uh, enhances the body's own immune system uh, or it suppresses the uh, cancer's ability to withstand um, the immune system. So those are the differences. Okay, and I think perhaps that might be a good uh, point to um, feel some questions before we go on to the challenges and pitfalls. Uh, got it, Prof. So um, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to kind of drop questions here. I know you might need a few seconds to kind of... Uh, uh, put in your question. So we, while waiting for that, there's, there's some questions that we have already, Prof, if, uh, if you're okay, I'm just going to kind of fill them to you. Yep. Um, is that okay, Prof? Yep. Oh, lovely. Um, so Prof, there's, there's one question uh, on um, when uh, we always speak about um, surgery as one of the primary options in uh, management of colorectal cancer. I think uh, one of the things that you've told us today is how multi-model this is. And uh, the thing is for a lot of primary care physicians, um, a lot of our patients actually come back to us to kind of get uh, a reassurance and kind of additional information after they've seen the surgeons or after they've seen the primary kind of management team. Uh, in your opinion, Prof, should, should um, kind of a discussion be had with patients from, uh, say, whoever is the physician who consults them frequently on the idea of multimodality and, uh, you know, the, the kind of options that are available to patients. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, this is, this is a concern that, you know, even is, is expressed to us uh, when we have already diagnosed patients. Um, I think the, the first thing to say is that uh, multimodality treatment tends to be for more advanced stages. So what we really want to try and do is detect it early, you know, even detect it in the pre-cancerous um, stage, which is why screening is so important. Um, because if you can pick it up at that early stage, um, let's say you've got an advanced um, uh, polyp, um, that's something that we can actually address completely just by endoscopic resection. So they won't even have to undergo surgery and they will not need to have um, further systemic therapy. Um, so, so really, this is why screening is so important, why we really would uh, appreciate it if, um, you know, our colleagues, um, our non-surgical colleagues um, could push that agenda forward. <laughs> you know, we want to avoid even taking them to surgery in the first place. Now, even at um, stage one, stage two, um, for most patients, uh, surgery alone is sufficient. Okay, obviously we would discuss this within within the MDT, but but for the most part, um, surgery alone will be sufficient. Now there are a subset of um, high risk state foods, and in particular for rectal cancers as opposed to colon cancers, that might benefit from um, adjunctive or adjuvant treatments. Okay, so again those would be discussed. Once you start getting towards stage three and stage four, then, you know, you almost certainly will be um, recommended to have uh, a combination of, of treatments. So, you know, so that's, that's, that's why, uh, you know, it's important for um, patients to understand that the earlier they come to get treatment, uh, the less likely they are to need all these other forms of treatment other than surgery. 
Right. Well, do Prof, there's a question from uh, another colleague, and uh, this this I think is a it's a bit of a multi-model question as well. So he asks whether an altered bowel habit is often. I mean, we understand it's an early warning sign, but is there any reason or why patients delay, and is there anything we can do to kind of um, convince them that you know to go and 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 uh, get tested or get a colonoscopy or something like that? So, so firstly. Um there aren't really any early warning signs of colorectal cancer because by the time you have signs, it usually means it's, it's late. Again, so that's why we are pushing screening so much because colorectal cancer will remain asymptomatic for years, right? So um, basically what we need to, uh, maybe this, this requires a, a shift in mindset I, I know I was taught certainly in, in med school um, that, oh, if it's a young patient and they're having a little bit of, uh, you know, altered bowel habit or they're having a bit of bleeding, it's fine. You know, it's probably hemorrhoids or constipation or whatever. And, and we know that's, that's no longer true. And so I would say that uh, if they have symptoms, uh, it certainly warrants um, investigation if it doesn't settle within a week or two. I think really they, they, they should be investigated. If they're over the age of 50, they definitely need to be investigated. I would not just uh, put it down to colitis or whatever, you know, yeah. So, so I think that, that mindset needs to change, um, that, that we can manage this without further investigation. Right. Thank you, Prof. And, and you know, uh, I think one of the things that, that Prof is kind of putting forward very uh, kind of strongly is the fact that this needs to be something we need to take on. And it needs to be a continuous thing as well, because knowing Malaysians, we'll do it once and then, you know, it goes away. We, we kind of push it off. So again, a lot of role for primary care physicians to kind of aggressively make sure that, you know, your patients are being taken care of in that sense. Uh, Prof, my favorite, favorite question has come up and I need to put this to you to get it uh, kind of always from the horse's mouth. Is checking tumor markers for colorectal cancer a good practice for screening? No, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, but I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, Essentially, whatever tumor markers you're looking at, and, and I include things like, um, you know, the DNA panels that some uh, parties are, are pushing. All of these are indirect measures, right? That there's no one test that will tell you definitely that you have colorectal cancer or you don't. Um, and if you look at the sensitivities and specificities of tumor markers, they are actually not high enough for us to use them as uh, screening measures. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the whole point of screening is to try and pick uh, or detect cancers early. But the reality is that tumor markers only start to rise in more advanced stages. And so if you rely on that, then you're actually missing the boat. Um, so you might miss lots of cancers uh, if you're just relying on tumor markers. The second point is that you might actually over by diagnose as well because there are other uh, conditions that can push up um, uh, tumor marker levels. And so you might end up over investigating the patient because you're, you're looking for a reason why the tumor marker is elevated. So if you look at uh, um, screening guidelines around the world, um, especially for colorectal cancer, you know, tumor markers are not there as part of the screening protocol. Um, so yeah. The no. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof, there's, uh, I think it's still another one or two questions. Um, so I, can I just take out one more and then maybe you can feel the, some at the end. Um, there's one more question on, is endoscopic colorectal screening an MOH initiative? Uh, Prof might be not well uh, aware of this since Prof is the university setting, sir. But anyway, we'll fill it, Prof. When can we refer patients for this uh, as uh, some of our risk, our patients are at risk with positive family history, but cannot afford to go to the private for this area of need. Okay, I'll, I'll probably be addressing that in the next section because I'll be talking about screening um, and uh, what, what our uh, national guidelines uh, say as well. So perhaps I'll leave that till till after the next. Um... Okay, well do, Prof. And then, uh, uh, so this one is, uh, I think, very... Uh, 
surgical in nature. Two days after stenting the apple-shaped splenic flexure tumor, the stent failed to decompress the proximal dilated bowel. Um, do you think that laparoscopic approach should be kind of the first option to address this well? Um, okay, um, I probably need a little bit more information than that. But, but in general, um, you know, obstructing or obstructed tumors uh, would be usually more advanced. Um, and so if you had a patient who was unfit for surgery um, or, you know, has got uh, widespread metastases and so, you know, you're not aiming for, for cure, you're aiming for palliation, then stenting is reasonable to consider. Uh, I would say that the more proximal uh, you're trying to stent, the more technically difficult it is. Uh, and I would also say that uh, stenting is not always successful and it's also expensive. Um, it, if you look at, again, the, the, the guidelines around the world, and this is having done, the, the, there are quite a few uh, randomized control trials already looking at this issue. Uh, stenting is still inferior to surgery when it comes to uh, resolving uh, symptoms. Okay, so for, for us, we would really reserve this only for those patients um, that are, you know, really not fit for surgery and you're not expecting them to survive very long, but you want to kind of re relieve the obstruction a little bit. So that's one group of patients. The other group of patients would be those who are at that point in time are not fit because they're presenting emergently and we're using it as a bridge to surgery. So we stent them, you know, then we, we optimize them a little bit more and then we take them to surgery. So, so it's not really um, the best uh, modality of treatment, but it does have its uses. Okay, well do Prof. I'm, um, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've got some of your other questions and if, um, I'm going to just field them to Prof right at the end of the second segment. So, so don't worry about your questions not being fielded yet. Uh, and uh, as you all know, uh, we need two code words for the CME to actually uh, kind of put in the attendance. I'm going to give you the first code word now before Prof kind of kicks in the second segment and that is uh, 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 something which, in, an interesting word for today, which uh, Prof used, which was cosmesis. Uh, so, uh, yeah, feel free that that is your first code word today. And I'm going to turn um, uh, the session back to Prof so that she can go through the second segment and then subsequently we can take more questions. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, back over to you, Prof. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to go on with uh, some of the challenges and pitfalls uh, we experience in Malaysia uh, specifically. And I think some of the points I'm going to address are really not uh, unknown to you. Um, the first is that we have a very um, diverse healthcare system. You know, so on the left, you see the place where I work. Um, and, and I wouldn't say it's it's, you know, first world um, class, but, you know, we do have many of the uh, recommended um, uh, therapeutics and, and diagnostics. Um, so you would get a reasonable um, quality of care there. You then on the right have a smaller peripheral hospital uh, where you might not even have a surgical service. You definitely would not have an oncology service. And so for um, the population that um, is in the surrounding community, they may have problems with access uh, to the appropriate care. Um, I've mentioned that uh, surgery is the mainstay of, of treatment um, and what you will see here is the inequity in terms of distribution of surgical services. So you will see that the vast majority of surgical services are concentrated uh, in Peninsular Malaysia, in particular around um, the Klang Valley. And, and these are public um, hospitals, yeah? Uh, whereas you see in East Malaysia, which as mentioned before, has a significant population, um, the surgical services are quite limited and often these are general services, they are not uh, specialised services. 
So if you look at the care um, of colorectal cancer um, from a specialty point of view, um, you know, diagnostically, um, we would often have the gastroenterologist as our first port of call. Um, and then the surgeries are done by colorectal surgeons. Um, and the systemic therapy done by the oncologist. But what you will see here is that the numbers are very, very small. Uh, so the blue line is um, colorectal surgeons. And yes, we've increased a little bit, but um, you know we're still less than 100. And uh, as for gastroenterologists, yes, we've increased those as well, but you can see that it's starting to plateau. We've kind of reached um, the, the, the limit of um, how rapidly we're able to train, um, as well as the attrition from, from retirements. Okay, so, so we're kind of coming to a steady state as to what we can achieve um, with, with current uh, measures. Um, you can't see the oncologist very well because the reality is that there are very, very few. Um, I checked with the NSR and there are only 11 medical oncologists and two radiation oncologists on the register. So how do we actually manage the 3,000 odd new colorectal cancer cases a year um, is actually through um, non-specialized services. So you have the general surgeons who help, you have um, the medical officers uh, who are um, attached to those teams and so they help to deliver the services. Um, and uh, that's really how we are managing at the moment. The other point to mention is that those are absolute numbers, yeah? Uh, unfortunately, whatever expertise we have is also disproportionately distributed. Um, so you will see that although um, public healthcare services are responsible for perhaps 70% um, of care, uh, they only have about 30% of the um, uh, uh, expert staff. Uh, and the rest are actually in uh, private facilities. Um, but then they, of course, are not able to uh, manage the care of um, the vast majority of patients who are financially uh, restricted. Okay, and that's not even going into the, um, the GI uh, assistants, you know, the nurses who assist us in doing endoscopy. If, if you needed to work out those numbers, you know, you would see that we are far, far short of what is needed to provide services. And so this is therefore the reality, okay? We have a huge number of, of, of cancers and these are all cancers. And you will see that the government um, is spending a huge amount of money just on oncology drugs. Um, so if we don't push screening, if we don't push um, the detection, early detection of cancers, um, those numbers are not going to come down um, and it's going to really cripple our healthcare budget. Okay, and this is the impact on the patients themselves because as you know, um, not all uh, therapies are uh, covered by uh, government subsidies. Um, so there are patients who uh, are insured and are lucky in that, that respect, but a lot of our patients are paying out of pocket. And uh, so we have this term catastrophic um, healthcare expenditure um, where you know households are spending more than 30% of their total income just on healthcare. And unfortunately, um, this is the case in cancer therapy. So this, this slide is just to show you why, again, to emphasize why early detection is so important when it comes to uh, costs. So, and, and perhaps this is common sense, but we had to actually demonstrate it, right? So you will see in the table that we've divided the colorectal cancers into stage one to four. And then on the right-hand side, you will see what the average um, sort of cost um, is entailed in treating a patient. So what you will see is that as you go into more and more advanced stages, the cost really rises exponentially. Okay, so you will see that stage four cancers may cost as much as um, 35,000 uh, uh, ringgit to treat. Remember, this is a public hospital, so the costs in private healthcare will be far, far higher than this. Uh, as compared to um, stage one, which can be as low as uh, 7,600 ringgit. Okay, so over the 
the, the, the uh, spread of uh, thousands of new cases a year, you can see how uh, shifting the proportions from stage three and four to stage one and two can result in considerable um, cost savings. Okay, right now, the, the proportion of stage three and four is in the region of about 60% uh, across the country. So we want to try and reverse that um, proportion. Okay, what are some of the other challenges we have? Uh, well, we have challenges of geography. We have challenges of uh, cultural um, expectations. Um, and we also have to uh, grapple with um, socioeconomic variability. But on top of that, we also have to deal with natural disasters. And uh, these are just some images from a colleague of mine who was involved in the um, humanitarian efforts during the floods from a, a few years back. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, that's actually not during a flood. That is a normal situation for some of our um, indigenous populations. This is how they um, manage transport. And uh, you can see that to try and provide healthcare to those areas, you have to have um, the transportation means to be able to um, enter the area. And that includes, um, in the previous slide, was by, uh, by um, water. And then you also have by air. These are some of my colleagues who are, uh, were part of the flying doctor service. As you can see, it's actually not, not easy to manage if you're trying to transport patients from, from remote villages um, to hospitals, sometimes under emergent circumstances. And of course, uh, who can forget what's happened to us in the last year, you know, uh, where we've really had to uh, focus our efforts on the pandemic response. Uh, but unfortunately, this, this redirection of already limited resources has meant that um, patients are now more likely to uh, be delayed in their presentation because they're maybe afraid uh, or reluctant to come to hospitals. Uh, those who are already diagnosed um, may actually default their treatments or delay their treatments. Um, and we are really concerned that this is ultimately going to lead to a worsening of outcomes uh, for our cancer patients, as well as other, other um, chronic diseases um, that have been sort of sidelined by the pandemic response. So... Um, Let's get to the meat of the issue here, which is screening. I hope I've made the case to you that we really, really need to uh, focus on screening for colorectal cancer. Um, just to give you a little bit of background um, into this, uh, the idea of screening for colorectal cancer perhaps started in the 1960s. And uh, what we had at the time was an indirect test. So this is a, a stool occult blood test um, uh, called the Guayac test. Um, and what you will see in the um, image here is the difference between a positive test here on the right and a negative one on the left. Um, it just requires a bit of a, um, a fecal smear um, before it is sent for, for testing. But it is indirect. And as you know, you can have blood in your stool from, from other conditions like hemorrhoids, like fissures. Um, and so it's, it's not absolute. But at that point in time, we really didn't have an alternative method. Then in the 1970s, um, technology developed that allowed us to visualize um, the colorectal mucosa directly. And this is what we now recognize as um, uh, endoscopy or more specifically sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy for the lower GI tract. Okay, so you will see that actually it's not been around for as long as you might think. Okay, um, in fact, in Malaysia, um, interestingly enough, we managed to bring it in fairly soon after uh, it was developed for clinical service. Uh, so in Malaysia, it was pioneered again in the 1970s uh, by surgeons um, and, and, and not by a gastroenterologist at the time. But you can see that it was a very different animal than it is now. Uh, you can see that um, there were no TV screens you had to directly view uh, through the scope itself. Um, but, you know, it was still an advance. 
What was interesting, though, was that the prevailing perception at that time was that colorectal cancer um, was uncommon um, and, and therefore screening wasn't um, really uh, uh, pushed. Um, it, the scopes were mainly used for diagnostic purposes in symptomatic patients. So we now have uh, some good screening modalities. Who should we target for screening? If you look at the Malaysian clinical practice guidelines, we still recommend um, the age of commencement for screening to be 50, okay? And if you look at the um, image in the center, the, the question about, you know, how do we um, decide which ones to send for uh, a stool occult blood test and which ones need to go straight for colonoscopy, you will see that um, you would first need to do a risk assessment, okay? So uh, first you need to check whether they have symptoms or not. If they have symptoms, then you're no longer talking about screening, you're just talking about diagnostics, okay? And so that's a different algorithm. If they are asymptomatic, then you ask them about their um, family history, specifically for cancer. Okay, if they have no family history, then they fall under the category one or average risk. And these patients, um, you uh, can go ahead and do the stool occult blood test. Okay, if that is positive, then they get referred for colonoscopy. The, the downside of the stool occult blood test is that it does, for it to be effective, it needs to be done annually. Okay, and so this is something that patients uh, must be aware of. If they have some risk factor, okay, uh, in terms of their family history, so they have one or two relatives that have had cancer, um, but, you know, both of them were over the age of 50, etc. So, so these uh, would be categorized as moderate risk, and these are patients that um, perhaps even for primary screening should go directly to colonoscopy. And of course, category three, where they are, you know, that they're, they're part of a familial uh, cancer family, you know, they've got other high risk factors like inflammatory bowel disease, etc. Then these definitely uh, would be referred for colonoscopy. What about Asian guidelines? Um, so the Asia Pacific consensus uh, recommendations. I think the main thing here to to highlight um, is that. Uh, there is additional weightage given uh, for ethnic group. So they, 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 they actually have um, a weightage system um, to estimate risk. And uh, one of the weighted um, criteria uh, is uh, Chinese, es Chinese ethnicity. Okay, so that's weighted more highly. Uh, being male is also weighted more highly. But it's interesting to note that in terms of uh, what to use, they are still recommending just the quantitative FIT test. That's the stool occult blood test, the immunochemical test. Okay. The age um, at inception is still 50. However, in the US, and this is the American Cancer Society guideline that was updated in 2018, they have now dropped the initiation age to 45. And, and this is because of the data that I presented to you earlier that shows a rising um, incidence in younger patients. Okay, so that's, that's the main difference there. And so I would say that perhaps, perhaps um, while I, there isn't a change in our national guidelines and 50 is still the, the um, starting age. I think if patients have certain risk factors, you may want to offer screening at an earlier age. So if you look at ethnicity, so Chinese ethnicity, or perhaps those um, of the indigenous populations, maybe these you might want to offer a little bit earlier. How about which test to use? Um, I've mentioned the uh, stool occult blood test and uh, there are basically a few different kinds, okay? But firstly, you need to look at uh, what the Wilson and Youngner criteria for screening are. 
and basically you need we need to know that there is a significant healthcare problem uh, posed by a particular condition. Um, you should have a target population. You should be able to show that the test you're doing is uh, effective and acceptable um, with minimum risks and that it actually changes um, the long-term outcomes. Okay, so um, for colorectal cancer, all of these uh, uh, criteria have been fulfilled. In fact, it's probably uh, the cancer that best fulfills these criteria. Okay, so we go on to um, the uh, Guayac fecal local blood test that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is probably the uh, stool test that has the most evidence behind it. Okay, and basically the immunochemical tests have kind of just, uh, uh, you know, piggybacked on this. Okay, so as you can see, there are very large population studies that show that uh, if you perform um, these in the population, and if you can get um, sufficient numbers, uh, you will actually achieve a mortality reduction of even as high as 33%. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the Guayac fecal occult blood test um, usually requires some dietary restriction before it is administered. And we've shown in our population that dietary restriction, um, you know, fails dismally. Um, and then we end up having uh, quite a number of false positives. Okay, so there's non-compliance to the uh, dietary restrictions and medical restrictions as well for the Guayac test. Hence, we are moving more and more towards immunochemical stool testing. And this is just to show you an example of a kit. On the left, you will see the instructions that we give to patients as to how they are to collect the specimens. And this is something that you would have to do uh, in primary care if you are going to deliver screening. On the right, you will see the kit itself in diagrammatic form. And so you'll see that it uses uh, a, a, a strip test, very much like a pregnancy test, I would say. Um, so once the patient has collected the specimen and, and it's placed within the reagent here, uh, subsequently you just um, turn it the other way around, unscrew the cap, place your strip in, and you get the answer in five minutes or less. So um, here you would see that there is a positive strip here and the control strip is also positive, which shows that it's um, working. Okay, so um, the test that I just showed you is what we call a qualitative um, fecal immunochemical test. Uh, it just tells you whether it's positive or not. Um, so that's a preset um, level of, of detection. Um, and so it doesn't really allow for um, individualization for specific um, risk groups. Okay, but the good thing is that it's simple to do. You don't really need any special equipment. It avoids the dietary restriction. Um, but as I've said, you know, the sensitivity does depend on what the, the kit's cutoff values uh, have been preset to be. What about quantitative fit? This is something we have had a little bit of experience with. It allows um, more tailored screening. So for instance, if you think that the uh, level of detection should be lower for, say, um, you know, the female population, then you can actually preset that on the uh, analyzer um, and then run those uh, specimens through in, in, in one batch. Okay, so it's been shown that it increases the detection of advanced adenomas and it might actually allow us to prioritize our endoscopy services um, given the restrictions in the or limitations in facility and expertise. So for instance, um, if let's say the level that was detected was more than 200, then these really should be prioritized for scope, whereas if it's around 50, uh, then we wouldn't even consider that positive. If it's 100, then we would say, yeah, probably needs a scope, but perhaps um, uh, not as an immediate priority. Um, what about direct uh, methods of uh, diagnosis? So um, these would be your uh, endoscopic procedures. Um, and these are good because it allows you to directly visualize, localize, and also uh, obtain uh, tissue for diagnosis. Okay, so um, this shows a flexible sigmoidoscopy. As you can see, we would uh, introduce the scope right up to the splenic flexure. 
And given that, um, you know, in the region of 70% of colorectal cancers are on the left side, um, this may be sufficient for the majority. Um, and this actually has been uh, shown to be an effective strategy, just using flexible sigmoidoscopy. Uh, and it does have, uh, it does reduce incidence because you're able to uh, resect um, the uh, adenomatous polyps. And it also does uh, reduce mortality from cancer. Colonoscopy uh, gives you a more complete view of the um, colon and rectum. As you can see, we go all the way around, but it is technically more challenging. Um, it can be very difficult in patients with very tortuous uh, bowels or those who are not able to tolerate the insufflation um, of, of, of gas into the bowel, um, but it will give you a more complete view. And so basically, um, it's, it's just to show that, uh, again, you get a reduction in colorectal cancer incidence with primary screening with colonoscopy. Uh, you also get a significant reduction in uh, colorectal cancer mortality. Uh, and these have been uh, shown actually um, and compared with uh, um, fit testing uh, as a primary screening modality. Yes, you will detect a few more uh, right-sided uh, colorectal cancers compared to a sigmoidoscopy, uh, but this is balanced by the increased rate of complications from the procedure itself. And, and these are not um, insignificant, okay? There's even a mortality associated with colonoscopy. So imagine if you're doing colonoscopy for an otherwise well patient and they die from it, that is something um, that we... Uh, would not be uh, in favor of. Okay, so this is just to recap um, some of the studies that uh, have looked at comparing colonoscopy with um, just uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy and uh, fecal occult blood testing. And basically, there's no difference in the detection rate, but you do have a higher complication rate with colonoscopy. So what about other tests? You know, um, we've mentioned uh, tumor markers. Uh, there's also stool DNA testing that's available commercially. Uh, we've talked about circulating tumor cells, DNA panels, CT colonography, et cetera. Okay, so those are in terms of um, um, detecting those that would need to go on to a formal colonoscopy. Um, and then we have uh, other methods like confocal endomicroscopy, which is, is more to target where you're going to biopsy. Okay, but essentially the, the evidence for cost effectiveness um, in each of these methods is um, limited at the moment. But I'll just mention um, CT colonography because it does appear now in the guidelines as a form of or an acceptable form of screening for patients who are unable to undergo uh, colonoscopy. Um, and this is what it looks like. These are the images that you would see on the right-hand side. I, I would say that ultimately, though, it does not allow you to obtain tissue diagnosis. So, um, you know, even if you find something on this, um, they would have to undergo uh, some form of um, invasive um, testing to be able to obtain the tissues, okay? Plus, it does tend to miss small lesions, uh, you still have to undergo bowel preparation. So, uh, you know, you can't say to patients who don't want to go under, undergo bowel prep that they can avoid it because they still have to have bowel prep. Okay, so these are just some of the pros and cons of CT colonography. Um, I, I think we can't downplay the impact of um, being irradiated because we, that there's um, strong evidence now suggesting that radiation itself in the long term can increase your risk for developing cancers. Um, just very, very briefly about confocal laser endomicroscopy. Again, this is not something that is um, freely available in, in the country. Um, for, for us, it's mainly for research or workshop purposes. Uh, but what it does is it maybe allows you to target the lesions that you identify better so that you are more accurate in your um, uh, biopsy. Okay, because if you've got um, uh, larger tumors, if you or even small tumors, but you um, don't biopsy the right area, you might miss a cancer. So this actually allows you to do that better. 
can see the degree of resolution is actually incredible. Okay, so this is just to remind us again um, um, why uh, we are looking at fecal occult blood testing really as the mainstay of primary screening okay, for the average risk person because it works, it's cost effective, it's acceptable to most patients and there's low risk of uh, or no risk of um, uh, serious complications uh, from doing it. So uh, finally, in the last few minutes, um, and this is just my perspective, and obviously I'm not a primary care physician, but this is where I, I think we would really want our primary care colleagues to help us out with uh, some of these areas. Um, and I've summarized it as the five R's, you know, help to raise awareness about colorectal cancer in general, but also importantly, the value of screening. Um, perform the risk assessment in your clinics, even if the patient is coming in for something else, you know, they're over the age of 50 or, or in some patients over the age of 45, you know, do risk assess them to see whether they might be um, suitable for um, screening and also which method of screening, okay? Um, recommend the screening. You know, sometimes we, we informally risk assess patients, but then we, we forget to actually recommend it to them um, to have screening. Uh, so please do make that a routine part of your practice. Um, in patients that you suspect because of symptoms or because of um, the test being positive, uh, please refer them to us early for, for specialist care. Finally, I want to just touch on survivors. As we get better at treating patients, we have now a much larger proportion of survivors in the community and they face certain um, specific challenges which I will address uh, shortly. So um, even though we have a good um, methodology for screening and an effective methodology for screening, unfortunately even in developed countries the um, targeted uh, screened population rate of 65% uh, is still not achievable. And a lot of this is because of reluctance amongst um, the community themselves, you know, uh, because of the discomfort or the embarrassment of having to address the issue. Um, many still don't see the necessity for screening when they are well. Um, they say it's unnecessary. And there are, of course, those that fear uh, positive results. So this is a little bit like the... Um, ostrich attitude, you know, to, to healthcare where you bury your head um, because you are worried about a positive result. And it also appears to be that there are ethnic and cultural differences in terms of acceptance uh, for screening. And uh, we've shown that in, in uh, Malaysia as well, that in fact, um, amongst the Chinese who are at highest risk for um, getting colorectal cancer, they're the ones that actually have the most negative perception of it uh, and also have the uh, lowest degree of awareness. And now, this is, of course, an, an, an old study, um, not that old, um, but, you know, maybe that has changed, but I don't think so based on my personal experience. Um, we also know that there are inequities um, in terms of socioeconomic class, and this has actually got a strong correlation with the outcomes uh, as well as the stage at presentation. So all well and good, right? Let's just screen everybody, it's easy to do. Um, unfortunately, my experience in this area suggests that it might not be as straightforward as we might think. Um, so this was a project that we did uh, 10 years ago now. Um, where we actually offered free screening um, using the uh, stool test um, to the community. And uh, we thought that since perhaps awareness and understanding was one of the factors uh, for reluctance, we actually paired it with um, an awareness talk. We actually sat down with um, individual patients to actually talk through their, their um, concerns. And uh, we even did a survey to um, assess their acceptance of um, uh, screening. And so, you know, the vast majority of them said that they would, and in fact, they did uh, participate um, with an 82% positive 
response, not, not positive test, but positive response to testing. Okay, out of these, the proportion that were positive in terms of their stool tests um, was 7.8%. So it's small, but you know, we expect that it's going to be in the region of, of less than 10%. Um, unfortunately, even though we offered them free colonoscopies, only three of them turned up for the scopes. And this was despite us calling, offering to arrange transport, etc. You know, so the, the, the problem is not so much the stool test, it's the colonoscopies. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day of the, of the three scopes that we did, two of them did indeed have um, uh, adenomatous polyps, but no cancers were detected. So you can see a lot of work was done uh, for actually quite a small yield. Um, and I think that's been one of the challenges in, in getting screening going in this country because the yield does appear to be quite small for the amount of effort that's being put in. Um, these were some other um, community projects um, that uh, this NGO Empowered uh, has done. Um, this is uh, Dr. Christina Ng, and uh, she was one of our UM oncologists, and so we collaborated with her for some of these uh, community projects. Um, I think the main uh, takeaway from uh, those projects was that it was a very intensive uh, effort, again, you know, going from door to door to encourage people to have screening, offering them incentives, and then for those that were positive, you, we arranged transport, we organized the colonoscopies with uh, major hospitals. Um, and so because of this, we had a very high return rate. But again, the positive rate from the stool test was 8.9%, um, so again, less than 10%. Um, but we did manage to get more than 70% of them onto the colonoscopy. So, so that was uh, achieved. But out of that, we had six colorectal cancers. So that's a 0.3% rate out of all that were, that were screened. And similarly, in our own uh, institutional study, we've shown that actually the positive rate is, is quite low uh, and that ultimately it's going to be uh, less than 1% um, of all screen populations that, uh, that would end up with a diagnosis of colorectal cancer. Okay, similarly, um, this other community project. Okay, so it's, it's there or thereabouts, um, around a 10% or less positive uh, fecal occult blood um, test rate. Um, and then, you know, difficulties getting patients to colonoscopy unless you really bend over backwards to, to get them there. Um, and a very low yield in terms of cancer or advanced um, uh, adenomatous polyps um, in terms of diagnosis. And this is data from, um, these are national data, um, and, and it, it's very, very similar. Um, ultimately, you have something like 0.6% um, of um, colorectal cancers um, diagnosed. So finally, um, as I mentioned before, survivorship is, is now becoming an area of concern as we get better at treating cancers because long-term survival means that they're living with the chronic side effects of, of treatment and these can include things like fatigue, uh, anxiety, uh, sleep dysfunction, but also much more um, uh, immediately uh, troublesome problems like um, problems with nutrition, you know, problems with um, psychology and uh, body image problems. But also for colorectal cancer, many of them live with disordered bowel function. You know, um, to have uh, low anterior resection syndrome is not something very easy to deal with because you're maybe having to run to the toilet 10, 20 times a day, um, uh, you know, with, with urgency into the bargain. Um, for those who are living with stomas, those also have some, some uh, impact on quality of life. Uh, it affects their social functioning, etc. And of course, down the line, they may develop secondary cancers uh, that have to be dealt with. Um, I, I mentioned the younger patients. And unfortunately, although we do have some cancer advocacy groups, they're very often not focused on the young 
um, that have very specific issues in terms of still being part of the workforce, maybe having an impact on their income, um, earning capacity, etc. So, so a lot of areas um, to be addressed still. So this is my last slide. Uh, just to summarize, I think colorectal cancer still is an unmet healthcare need um, in Malaysia. And um, unfortunately, late presentations are still the majority of cases. And as I've shown you, this increases the risk of catastrophic healthcare expenditure, both for the individual and also for the country. Um, I think that primary care can play a major role in raising awareness, um, in implementing uh, primary screening, and therefore hopefully uh, increasing early detection um, as well as reducing healthcare costs. Um, I think primary care is also going to be more and more essential in assisting the long-term survivors as they grapple with, um, you know, living their lives after cancer. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, so much, Prof. I think there's very uh, succinct kind of presentation. I think you've encompassed every single problem that we have and hopefully we, there's no way to go but up, lah, hopefully. <laughs> Doesn't seem to though. Anyway, uh, a couple of questions uh, uh, from from leftover from the first segment, and then there's some questions coming in as well, Prof. Uh, Prof, the one question on does colon cleansing increase the risk of uh, colon cancer? I think there was one from a colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, colon cleansing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. So, firstly, I need to say that. Um, why do people do it? They, they feel that somehow by cleansing their colons that they will reduce their risk of diseases or, you know, um, being unwell. Uh, firstly, there's no evidence that it does so. Okay. Secondly, um, the procedure itself does also carry a risk of perforation. Okay. So you can actually develop complications from the procedure itself. Okay, does it increase the risk of colorectal cancer? No, there's, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that it increases the risk. Yeah. Okay, well, the Prof. There's another from a colleague who asks, I did a colonoscopy 10 years ago. Uh, do I need to do it again and when? Okay. So the, the, the interval between colonoscopies is... There, there, there is evidence to suggest what might work for most people most of the time, and that's how national guidelines are formed, right? You, you, you decide what is best for most people most of the time. Um, but whatever interval you choose, there is always a risk of what we call interval cancers, okay? So, of course, the longer your interval is, then the higher the risk of there being an interval cancer. Why do these interval cancers occur? Well, it's thought that either it was because um, uh, it wasn't the early stage of it was not visible at the time of the previous scope, you know, maybe it's to do with um, expertise, the completeness of the scope, all those sorts of things. But basically what we know is that there are interval cancers. Um, however, to do a colonoscopy every six months is also not feasible, nor is it, nor should it be necessary because there is a cost issue, there is a, the risk of complications, you know, which, which are not um, uh, non-existent. Um, so we wouldn't do that as well. So um, from the work that has been done, um, this is where the recommendations for an average risk person so this would be, to all intents and purposes, somebody over the age of 50, no family history, no symptoms, no other risk factors, um, and, and you want to screen them. So these are the people that we say, if you have a complete scope, good visualization, completely normal, then um, you probably don't need another scope for 10 years, provided you remain asymptomatic during that time. If you develop symptoms, then that's, you know, yeah. that next into the diagnostic pathway already. Right. So that's a different thing. However, if let's say you've got not quite a familial uh, family history, but you know, you've got one relative maybe, or maybe you're a smoker, you know, something like that, then maybe you want to bring it down to five years. Um, and that's, this is, this is different from 
surveillance. So surveillance is, is those patients who have already had a cancer mm -hmm. and we're just um, uh, following them up. Um, so the, the, the intervals for them are different from, from that. Right. Uh, I was just going to interject to kind of continue on that question, Prof, and ask you if you had a colonoscopy and let's say you had some polyps and those were removed, does that make you uh, need to undergo colonoscopies a lot more frequently? Uh, short answer is yes, usually, um, but I would qualify that by saying it depends on what his uh, HPE. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, inflammatory polyps um, don't don't really uh, carry um, too much risk. Uh, in fact, they they, they don't um, progress to becoming malignant polyps. But then you have your adenomatous yes. polyps. Even within adenomatous polyps, you have you know the villus, the tubular, and then the ones in between. So obviously, villus um, adenomas have a much higher risk of uh, turning cancerous. So, so the general rule of thumb is if it's an adenomatous polyp, uh, then we would recommend that you have a repeat colonoscopy at least um, uh, in the next year, mm -hmm. so in a year's time. Okay, so that's what we call uh, polyp surveillance. But some of the other types, you might not need to have it so frequently. Right, and I think uh, that's one of the narratives that I think need to be kind of put forward that might be helpful for our colleagues as well to patients is that this is one of the few cancers that you can talk about kind of in that sense, primordial prevention. Mm. And, and you, you're going to, um, by picking up a polyp, you actually get rid of even the idea of, of cancer forming, you know. If that helps to push screening, does that, Prof? Does... Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, and that's that's actually how I frame it to to my patients as well. You know, yes, it is a, um, a a bit of an inconvenience now. Yes, there is a bit of a cost to it because you know we can't offer colonoscopy for free for for, mm. for patients, but uh, it potentially avoids the risk of you know having to spend hundreds of thousands on advanced cancer treatment you know, with, with a poor quality of life at the end of it. So, um, yeah, and, and, and it's not going to necessarily be a scope every year, as, as I've said, you know, it might be just once in 10 years, um, but it's, it's worth doing. Yeah, I, I always kind of say it's cheaper than changing your iPhone. La. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, prof, another question on uh, prevention, Prof, and dietary prevention uh, in terms of colorectal cancer. Any kind of uh, uh, insights that you could offer, Prof, pertaining to this? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, in terms of uh, prevention. Um, so I'm, I'm going to address all the sort of lifestyle uh, preventive measures because there's, there's quite good evidence that um, it, it, it does work. Um, so in terms of diet, uh, what we recommend is that um, there should be a low um, fat diet in terms of saturated fats, okay? So, so from, from animal origin uh, particularly, um, and this is where the, the, the red meat, you know, avoidance of red meat and all that comes in because they tend to have more saturated fats. But also it's the way that you prepare the meat um, so for those of you who like barbecuing, unfortunately, that's one of the, the, the no-nos, right? Um, because of the impact of the high direct heat on, on the, the, the protein, as well as the, um, the, the, the smoke from the uh, charcoal, from the burning charcoal itself, that, that has been shown to be carcinogenic. Um, so yeah, the, the way that you prepare the meat is, is also important. Um, and then the other uh, big factor is fiber, okay? Um, so uh, we need to include uh, fiber uh, in the diet from, from natural sources, uh, preferably rather than from uh, supplements. So, so that's in terms of the dietary uh, advice. Um, then there's also physical activity. So unfortunately, our sedentary lifestyle also puts us at higher risk of developing cancers in general, but certainly colorectal cancer uh, is, is one of them. Okay, so we advise uh, uh, moderate um, activity. Uh, doesn't have to be running a marathon, you know, just make sure you get up and walk around and go for a walk um, uh, a couple of times a week. Yeah. 
Okay, got it, Prof. Uh, in terms of screening, Prof, this other colleague asks, um, is there a difference in family history of colorectal cancer or does a family history of any kind of cancer, does that play an impact in kind of determining screening and, and kind of further management? Yeah, so we, we of course, pay, pay um, close attention to colorectal cancer family history, but um, we also know that... Um, certain cancers like breast cancer, gynae cancers, um, other GI tract cancers uh, may actually also uh, increase your risk for developing colorectal cancer. So yes, any uh, family history of cancer is um, important to know, um, but of course, in particular, colorectal cancer. Right. Uh uh, how about, th this is a question, Prof, on um, avoiding recurrence among colorectal cancer patients. Uh, any kind of uh, like very brief insight into uh, how is surveillance conducted? And Okay, so, so firstly, um, all the, the lifestyle uh, interventions that I mentioned that's good for prevention also works for cancer survivors. So we would give that, that same advice. Um, in, in fact, it's been shown that if you are um, physically active that actually reduces your risk of um, uh, recurrent or having uh, metachronous tumors in the gut uh, further down the line. So, so we do um, advise that. In terms of the surveillance, um, again, what what I'm going to say here is 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 on average this is what we do. Okay, but it, it is sometimes tailored towards individual patients. So um, we know that the chances of recurrence uh, are highest in the first two to three years. Okay, so in fact, 90% of recurrences happen in the first three years, 80% in the first two years. Okay, so this is the period when we really um, surveil patients very, very closely. In fact, for the first um, two years, I would see my patients every three months. Um, and uh, depending on what stage they were diagnosed at, we may also uh, require um, tumor marker testing. So usually CA, sometimes we will also request the CA-19-9, uh, particularly for right-sided cancers. Um, and then uh, at the end of the year or after six months, we uh, would do a colonoscopy. Okay. Um, and then... Um, Again, depending on stage, we might also ask for either a CT scan or even a PET CT, uh, depending on you know what the stage was at diagnosis. Um, so that that carries on for for two years. Uh, at the third year, if everything's uh, fine, then we might actually space it out a little bit more. Maybe see them six monthly, um, and then after that, annually for the fourth and fifth years. At the end of five years. Um, uh, I do offer them the option of, um, you know, not following up in specialist care, right? Um, and so they can opt to be followed up thereafter in primary care. Uh, but, you know, not all primary care doctors are happy to, uh, to do surveillance. Um, and uh, sometimes patients themselves are not happy. They would rather be seen by um, a specialist. So... Yeah, so then we just follow them up for life. And as you can imagine, that might clog up our clinics. Quite exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Prof, there's another question on occult blood, blood uh, positive test rate less than 10%. Does that mean that colorectal cancer will still be diagnosed late? Um, no, I think, I think just generally, if you look at the... Um, um, prevalence of colorectal cancer in the country. We, we aren't like, um, you know, the US or Australia where, where the prevalence is very, very high. Um, so we're not, we're not as high as that. And, and that's generally been the case in, in Asian populations with the exception of perhaps Japan, Korea, yeah, so, and Singapore. So Japan, Singapore, Korea, they, they tend to have incidences much more like Western populations. Um, so, so generally, our incidence and prevalence is lower than the West. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not surprised that the detection rate is using the FIT is, is not that high. It's around less than 10%. Okay. But it's a relatively easy test to do. 
you know, and so even if we are only picking up 1% of the population screen, uh, if you're screening 10,000 people, 1% is still a significant number. And these are people that maybe you've prevented cancer from developing because you get it at an early stage. So, so um, the question was whether we will miss whatever modality you use, you might miss cancers. But that's why the interval is very important. It's very important to understand that there's no 100% foolproof tests. Even colonoscopies can miss yep. a tumor. Even you know a CT can miss a tumor. Okay, but on the whole, if they do the test annually, the stool test annually, there's a very high chance that if they've got a cancer, it will be picked up. Yep. Yep. Got it, Prof. Um, this is um, I, I'm breaking this question, Prof, into about two other questions. First question from from this colleague is: Should um, gastroenterologists uh, are they equally uh, able to perform screening colonoscopies as colorectal surgeons? If you were to ask a gastroenterologist, they would say they are better. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so let me put it this way. Um, uh, when, when you're talking about colonoscopies as, as a diagnostic tool, um, so all of us who perform colonoscopies have been trained to do diagnostic colonoscopies to a similar standard. Uh, and in fact, in, in the UK, um, the, the screening colonoscopies are done by nurse practitioners. So it's actually not done by, by the yes. Okay, because all you're doing is you're actually visualizing the colon and then you're, you're uh, you know, you're not performing anything in a therapeutic. Okay, so the additional training that gastroenterologists and colorectal surgeons have is for the therapeutic component, where let's say you've already diagnosed um, uh, an advanced polyp, and then you're deciding that, okay, it's a little bit big, but you think that it can still be removed endoscopically, but it's not going to be a simple snare, you actually have to uh, dissect around it, perform something called the uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection. So that requires additional training that carries um, a higher risk of perforation and possibly needing emergency surgery. So, so it's those sorts of things that uh, need specialist um, uh, care, right? So a gastroenterologist or a colorectal trained surgeon, uh, colorectal surgeon trained in those uh, procedures. Okay, but if it's just for screening, you know, just for diagnosis, uh, then I would say not really much difference between uh, gastroenterologist and colorectal surgeon. But the colorectal right. surgeons will be able to deal with the complications, complications. Like perforation and bleeding and all that, yeah. Right. And so the, this uh, colleague has the second part of the question, Prof, which is, uh, I mean, because a lot of hospitals have packages in which you do OGDS and colonoscopies at the same time, um, do you, would you recommend, uh, I mean, doing it that way or, you know, is there any additional benefit? Is there no benefit? It's just cheaper though. <laughs> well, I would say that, um, I, you know, that, that, that's... From a medical point of view, we, we would say that, you know, why do a test if it's not necessary? Um, and at the moment, screening for gastric cancer in Malaysia, um, the, the, the data in terms of incidence and risk doesn't seem to support that for the, for the majority. Um, but, but I understand where, where patients are coming, coming from, you know, I'm, I'm going to hospital anyway, I'm going to be having the sedation anyway, why don't I just do the, the upper scope? Um, and, and I suppose if that's your uh, thought process, as long as you're paying for it, um, and you're aware that each procedure separately has its own risk, yeah. um, then, then by all means. I would say though that for those who are um, insured, the insurance companies have picked up on this, you know, um, and and they actually came up with a, a circular, I think it was last year, uh, stating that they would no longer be covering, you know, uh, pan endoscopies uh, mm -hmm. more, uh, which, which, which kind of, um, on the one hand, I can, can understand where they're coming from, but on the other hand, we do genuinely have patients that need both an upper and lower scope uh, concurrently. Uh, because the symptoms are a little bit non-specific and it could be from both the upper or lower uh, GI. 
So, so that's been a problem, actually. Yeah. Okay, Prof. I'm just gonna. I'm. I'm sorry. We seem to be really um kind of. Uh, uh, ringing out, uh, ringing you out over the morning. I'm going to take two more questions and then I'm, I'm going to call this uh, to uh, recess. Uh, Prof, one uh, a question from a colleague on pre and probiotic, any kind of uh, value in, in this in terms of colorectal cancer? Um, okay, so probiotics first, because I think there's, there's a little bit more evidence on, on probiotics. Um, as, as, as you know, it, it, probiotics just contain a number of uh, bacteria species that is supposed to contribute to, to gut health. Um, and I think there is some value to using probiotics, particularly in uh, conditions like um, um, IBS, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, um, because it may be because of an imbalance uh, in the microbiome. Uh, in terms of colorectal cancer, does it have a preventative value? Um, I, I don't think the evidence uh, supports that. Uh, whether, you know, uh, primary prevention or prevention after um, uh, having been diagnosed and treated for it. So, so I don't think there is any uh, strong evidence to support that. However, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do in the course of diagnosing and treating colorectal cancer can upset the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And, and as I presented uh, before, we know that it, it does play a role. So again, I don't have strong evidence to, to prove this, but it makes sense that you might want your patients to be on probiotics uh, during or after treatment um, uh, for a short period of time. But I wouldn't say this is something that you go on lifelong. No. Okay, got it, Prof. Um, prebiotics, there's really not a lot of evidence for supporting prebiotic use at all. Okay, <laughs> got it. Um, th th uh, this one, uh, another question, Prof, on if you've done a colonoscopy and no cancers are detected while waiting for the next colonoscopy in 10 years, do we still need to do the kind of fecal occult blood test uh, yearly during that 10 years? Okay, so um, I don't think anyone specifically looked at this question but in general the recommendation for the 10 years comes because uh, if if you selected this this average risk group and they have a completely clear colonoscopy if you wait 10 years and they have they've got no symptoms in between the number of interval cancers is actually quite small <laughs> yeah so so yeah we usually it's you choose one or the other lah. Ah, right okay Got it. Uh, and I think this one is uh, very related to our vaccination issue, uh, Prof. So, and this will be the last question, ladies and gentlemen, for today. Um, um, COVID vaccination in patients who are colorectal cancer survivors. Some people are hesitant about it. How, any tips on how we could advise patients regarding acceptability? Right. So, one of the general problems with giving advice about COVID is because the, the evidence base is evolving even, even as we speak, right? Um, and, and so some of the earlier guidance was um, based on, um, you know, assumptions based on uh, what we knew about the immune system in colorectal cancer patients, etc. Okay, but since then, obviously more, more uh, evidence has uh, evolved. And so what, what I would say now is that having cancer in and of itself doesn't um, preclude you from having vaccination. Um, if you're not currently on active treatment, then yeah, in fact, you should, you should have vaccination. Okay, just like, like the rest of the population. Um, if you are on active treatment and the treatment is... Uh, you know, has, has, has this, this, you're showing some evidence that your immune uh, system is, is uh, adversely affected, then these are the ones that we would have to have a long discussion about the pros and cons of having it. If you're on treatment, but, you know, we're not worried that it is um, suppressing your uh, immune response. In fact, these are people that you would strongly recommend to have vaccination because they might, 
you know, be exposed to uh, worse outcomes if they did get infected with COVID. So I'm, I'm saying it in a very complicated way. So basically, if you are a cancer patient, you can have vaccination unless your doctor thinks that you're not able to um, uh, or you're at risk if you have it. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Prof. So um, really, once again, please allow me to thank Prof on behalf of all our colleagues today for spending her most of a Saturday already uh, on uh, this and, and the very uh, interesting and insightful sharing with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, second code word for today, it'd be crazy if I did not say this, occult. Spell it any way you want. So it's a cult for those who didn't get the first code word as usual. I'm just being extra kind. It's cosmesis. Spell it again any way you want. I've put it on the chat as well. So uh, you need to do that to get your uh, C CME points. The link is in your email that you got previous to uh, signing up for the session. And uh, for those who are non-medical doctors, you will get an e-cert. Please just uh, fill in the form that you already have in your email. Again, we'd like to thank as well our uh, sponsors for the entire SKD sessions, Roche uh, Diagnostics, Pharma and Shared Services for their wonderful support of this ongoing series. And, uh, oh, sec so, sorry, Prof, the uh, second code word. Second code word is occult, ladies and gentlemen. So with that, have a wonderful weekend and um, hopefully we'll see you all again uh, very soon. Thank you very much, Prof, again, and have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.